This course is a real deep dive into the world of prototyping with Figma. We're going to have a closer look at basic setup for prototyping, smart animate, interactive components, as well as documenting and sharing our prototypes with others. We'll start with the basics and learn how to connect screens, set different scrolling behavior and preview our designs. We'll then move on to Smart Animate, the magic part when it comes to prototyping in Figma. I'm going to show you all of Smart Animate's superpowers and we're also going to talk about the limitations and do some troubleshooting. Once we understand Smart Animate, we're going to move on to set up micro interactions with interactive components in Figma. Interactive components will save you a lot of time when it comes to adding standard behavior to instances all across your design. Once we start combining our newly learned skills and add a bit of auto layout to the mix, you'll see Figma's true potential coming alive. I'll supply you with plenty examples to explore in the playground files. To round up, I'm going to show you tips and techniques for documentation and sharing your prototypes with others. We'll take a look at the documentation of interactive components within Figma as well as external design systems. I'll supply you with a Figma file that lets you work alongside me during the videos or return to exercises with detailed instructions in your own time. This course is for you if you have basic knowledge of Figma or if you're an advanced Figma user and want to improve your prototyping skills. You might want to work alongside me, so I prepared some files for you to download. Simply go to moonlearning.io resources minus student. It's really important that you enter the URL just like this and don't navigate via the moonlearning.io website because this area is a hidden area and it's only visible via this link to existing students. On this page, you find a variety of downloads. You can simply pick the course that you're currently taking and then just click download and it will automatically download the file for you. To import the files you just downloaded, it's important that you have a Figma account. Inside your Figma account, navigate either to Drafts or go to a project inside a team. Click on the Import button and you can choose which file you'd like to load. It might take a moment as they're quite large, but once you imported them, they will be on your account and you do not need to repeat this process. Inside the file, you'll find material to work alongside me in the videos, but I also added some instructions so you can always come back in your own time and try out and practice. I am working with Google Fonts for most of my designs. So if you're working with the Figma app, then you don't need to do anything. All Google Fonts are preloaded automatically. If you want to work with Figma in the browser, then you just need to search the font that it's showing you as missing. For example, Poppins, I use a lot. And then you can directly download this font, install it on your computer and you're ready to go. So let's get started with some basic around the workspace when dealing with prototyping. So here we have some design set up, some for mobile and some for desktop. And per default, we're going to be in the design tab. And next to the design tab, you find the prototyping tab. Or you can also use the shortcut to toggle between them, Alt, 8, 9. And by the way, 0 will be inspect mode. So we're going to get to know this menu here in more detail. For now, just note that if you click on the gray canvas, then you're setting the overall prototype settings. So any device that you want to set, going to get to know more about that later and if you want to change the background and that's going to be in the presentation view which we're going to have a look at in a minute. If you however select any frame on your canvas then you'll see that the prototyping menu here changes and this is where we're going to be working most of the time. So we're going to learn how to set up different flows, how to set up interactions and animations between different screen and even within component sets. And we're going to talk about scrolling behavior. And if you click here, then you're basically going to jump back to your general prototype setting. So this is the same menu as if I would just click 
on the canvas background. Let's do that again. I select any frame. Now you can see this is the frame prototype settings. Show prototype settings is just for the general setup for all the frames and all elements. So in here in our design file, this is where we're going to set up the design and all the behavior of our prototype. If we want to see our prototype in action, then we need to hit the little play button at the top right hand of your file. This then jumps to presentation or preview mode. If you hover over this, you're also going to be shown the shortcut. In my case, as I'm on a Mac, this is Alt, Command and Enter. And you can see that this is now opening a new tab. So in this preview, you're going to see a single frame at the center. If you click on a black background, then you get some more options up here. So you could comment and share comments with your team. And on the right hand side, you get the sharing options. So with a link or by invite, you can share and even get an embed code for your prototype. And we're going to talk about all of these sharing options in more detail during the course. And here you have the options of how you want your prototype to be displayed. If you simply use Z, then you can toggle through the different options. So you can see different sizes, how you want it to be displayed. You can simply use your keyboard keys to jump to the next frame, even if you have no connections set up already. And note the order that Figma uses here. So this is really handy because Figma actually picks the first frame it finds and then it goes through the row of frames. If there's no more frames, then it's going to jump to the next available frame. So this doesn't have to be a clear row. It could be something like this, but Figma is going to interpret this as a row and go through the frame one by one. Now, where should you set up your prototypes? Well, as you can jump from the design to the prototyping tab in Figma, you could just set them up in your existing designs. That might be okay for a very small project, but in general, I recommend that you make a copy of your screens and then set up at least an own page or even an entirely own file and copy your frames over here. And I would now have this designated place only for my prototyping. The reason for this is that if I'm working with prototyping, I'm going to set up probably many versions and tweak my designs a little bit for prototyping to work the way I want to. Meanwhile, I want my design to stay pretty clean and just be an overview of the existing pages. This is going to make more sense once we start building our prototypes and also once we talk about documenting different behaviors. In Figma, you can set up a device preview, which is pretty nice. So if we select this screen here and let's jump back to our design tab, I can see that this screen is set up as an iPhone 14. Now, if I jump back to my prototyping menu, I can go to show prototype settings or this is the same as if I simply click on the gray canvas and then in device, I can choose the iPhone 14 from my preset devices. I can choose a color here. So let's just go for starlight and I could also alter the background color to my liking. So now let's hit play again. And you can see that now my design sits inside this device. Now, the only thing you need to watch out for is if you're now going through your different screens, that it's all perfect as long as you keep on working on this mobile size. As soon as you're reaching your desktop view, which I have on the same design file, you can see that it simply jumps here, but it's keeping those prototype settings because they're set for this entire page. So if you want to use a device preview, I recommend that you set up a second page for prototyping. So I'm going to call this prototype desk. And I quite like adding some icons, but it's absolutely nothing that you have to do. You can just copy them in and I'm going to use this little prototyping icon here. And now I'm going to call this one prototype mob. So this is where my mobile screen is going to be. And I also like to do sort of a separator. If you're on the free Figma plan, then you might not be allowed to have that many pages. So then just leave it all on one page and just don't use a device preview. And so now all I need to do is I copy them over to my new page. And you can already see that here 
in the device setting they're set to none. I usually leave desktop at none, but you could also have a look if there is a, a device you want to use. So you can see 1280. So I have to check that would correspond to the MacBook Air. So I'm going to prototype and I could now simply choose the MacBook Air and I would have this one here. So now as I'm playing, you can see that this page is set up for the MacBook Air. And if I'm jumping back and I'm selecting my mobile view, then here this one stays with the device of the iPhone. So this is a really important concept to understand that prototypes don't communicate across different pages, even if they're in the same file. In Figma, we can set up our designs in such a way that in presentation mode, some elements are fixed and some are scrollable. Let's have a look. Here I have the design of a mobile screen. I want the navigation on the top to stay fixed while the content scrolls. I have another add button down here, which I also like to stay fixed. Let's have a look at presentation mode, how this looks right now. So if I press on the play button, I can see my prototype and I can see that if I try scrolling it, absolutely nothing happens. So let's jump back and set this up. For scroll to actually work, we need content that is larger than the frame. So here I select the parent frame called mobile and on the right hand side, you can see a little checkbox called clip content. If I uncheck this box, you can see that my card group is actually much larger than my original frame. And this is really important. If you do not have content that you can clip and that will basically overflow your frame, then you cannot add scroll. You can have this checked or unchecked. It doesn't make any difference. What you need to do now is to jump into prototyping mode. So click on the prototyping tab on the top right corner and then in overflow scrolling, choose vertical scrolling. Let's jump back into our presentation mode and see what that did. So I can now scroll the content, but as you can see, my header and my button here are not fixed. So let's go back and set this up. Choose the element, in my case, the header that you want to stay fixed and jump into prototyping. You will see under position the option to fix stay in place. Notice that here on the child element, you also get the option to set the overflow behavior. So that would be the scrolling behavior within this nested frame. In this case, we don't want any behavior. We already set our vertical scroll to the parent container. Let's also fix this button down here. We're going to set this to fix stay in place as well. And now let's hit play and have a look what this looks like. So my parent container scrolls nicely and all my fixed elements stay in place. If you're ever experiencing scrolling not working, then make sure that you check three things. First of all, in your design tab, make sure that you have clipped content that is larger than the frame you're dealing with. In the prototyping menu, make sure that your overflow scrolling is set. Once you have the parent element set up, now choose the child element you want to fix in place, go to prototyping and then on position, choose fixed stay in place. Sticky elements on scroll. You can also create the effect that elements just stay sticky when they reach the top of your screen. This is pretty much the same setup as for fixed elements. So you need to make sure that your parent frame has clipped content overflowing the frame for this to work. And this needs to be set to vertical scrolling. Now unclip and then choose the elements that you want to stay sticky. So in my case, this is this section called new and this section called saved. And then I am jumping back to prototyping and now in position, instead of fixed, I'm going to choose sticky stop at top edge. 
What's important for this to work is that you need to set up the order in your layers panel in such a way that the position that's coming last, so in my case, this blue one here called saved, is on top of the other one. So it looks like this one is first, but basically in my layer hierarchy, in reality, this section two is on top of section one. Now let's choose the parent frame, go back to design, clip again, and let's hit play and see if that is working. And that looks just great. You might, however, still keep your header at fixed and then have those sections stop below the header. By simply fixing the header, that would not work because they would go after the same top edge. A little hack you can use here is to draw a frame around your section. So I call this here sticky. And then inside you can see I have my normal section placed and the frame around it is a little bigger. So this distance here is the same distance than the menu at the top. So I'm creating an artificial offset. And I did the same for my other section down here. So I did the same for the blue one here. So let's clip this and let's hit play and have a look. And you can see that now it buffers this little section. So it creates an offset to my menu and it's working just fine. One of the great powers of Figma is nesting frames. And this will also unleash a lot of possibilities when it comes to prototyping. So let's understand this a little better. So here I have my design, and this is usually the screen that I'm representing as a frame. And on here, I already set up everything that I want to stay fixed and scrollable. If I jump into my presentation mode, I can have my scrollable prototype. So far, so good. If I would, however, draw a frame around this one, so let's just draw a simple frame, and let's give it another background color so we understand this a little better. And I would now hit my presentation mode. Then you can see that Figma took the parent frame, so everything that is holding other frames, as my display frame. The great thing now is that everything I set up in this frame, so all the fixed element and all the scrollable elements, still stay in place and we can make great use of that. Because this allows us to present our prototype in context. So what we can do, for example, I set up here another frame, and on that frame I can add a headline, some description and bullets describing my prototype, and I also added an image, so a mock-up where I will place my prototype. You don't have to add that. So now I'm going to jump over and copy my original design and with it, I copy all the setups, all the scrolling and fixed elements, and I'm going to paste it inside my mock-up here. Let's round the corner so it fits a little better. So if I now select this frame and press presentation mode, then it will show me the entire frame. So the entire presentation slide that I set up. And the great thing is that my prototype will still be working. So I can really present it in its environment. If you move your mouse to the top right hand corner of the screen, you get the options drop down. And here you can choose things like if you want the presentation to be fit to screen, full width and so on. Whatever you choose here, if you then hit the sharing prototype button, anybody viewing your presentation with that link will then have the same presets. You can also connect different presentation frames. So just as a standard prototype. This way you can create a presentation that includes a working and clickable prototype. Besides that this is a really amazing feature to wow everybody in a presentation, it's really great to understand how prototyping in Figma works. Namely, that you set the prototyping on the individual frames. And this is something that's going to help you a lot when we dive a little deeper into setting up different scroll directions. 
Let's investigate the different scrolling directions in Figma a little further. So we have vertical, horizontal and the combination of both that we want to have a look at. Let's start with vertical, which is also the most common one. Remember, for all of them, in order for scrolling to work, you need to have clipped content. That means you need content that overflows your frame. So if that is the case, simply jump into your prototyping tab and under overflow scrolling, set this to vertical scrolling. If we now hit presentation mode, everything will be scrollable. As we've learned before, we can also select certain elements, jump back to design and fix them in position. So if we jump back to preview mode, you can see that now the header will be fixed and just the body will be scrollable. So, so far, whenever we dealt with scrolling content, we added it to the parent frame. But the great thing in Figma is then we can add it to any nested frame. So let me show you the difference. First of all, let's select a parent frame here, jump back to prototype and take off vertical scrolling. So you can just set it back to no scrolling. Now, instead of the parent frame, I'm going to select the nested frame here. So the card group, and I'm going to set this to vertical scrolling. So let's jump to our preview mode and see if this works. Well, it's not really working. It, this is weird little jumping movement, but it's not scrolling this content. So let's see why that is. Now, remember that we need clipped content, so content that is larger than the frame in order for scrolling to work. Let's jump back to our design tab. So we can see here that on the parent frame, that was true. Our card group was larger than the frame. Therefore, it started scrolling. But now we apply the scrolling to this nested frame. And you can see that this is not going to clip because the frame that's surrounding it is actually holding that whole content in one. So what I can do now is select this frame and I can now resize the frame. Make sure you activate clip content so you can see that your frame is actually smaller than your content. And I can now adjust it till the bottom of my parent frame. So now let's try it again. Hit play and you can see that now only the card group is scrollable. Note how the search bar and everything else stays in place. Understanding that you can apply the scroll behavior to either the parent frame or nested frame is really important to unleash the full power of prototyping. Let's have a look at horizontal scrolling. So here again, we need to select the nested frame because if I would apply scrolling to the parent frame, that would scroll the entire frame. But I only want this part here of the card group that has horizontally stacked cards. Now let's try the same as before. Simply select that group, go to prototype and change it to horizontal scrolling. If I now press preview, that's again not going to work and just going to give me this jumpy behavior. So let's do the same as we did with the vertical scroll. Let's select the group, jump back to design and have a look what happens with clipped content. I can actually unclip the parent frame and then you can see the full size of the nested group. So as you can see, this frame has the size that includes all the cards so nothing can be clipped. So again, I'm going to just select this frame and resize the frame. Now, if I toggle clipped content, you can see the hidden content. So now my content is larger than my frame. Let's hit the play button again. And you can see that now my horizontal scroll is working. Okay, so the last one is combining horizontal and vertical scrolling. This is a typical behavior that you would want on a map or something like that. So if I unclip the content of this map, you can see that it's actually much larger than the frame. 
So I select this map, which is a nested frame, go to prototype and select horizontal and vertical scrolling. Now, because the content is already larger, I don't need to do anything else. Simply select the parent frame, hit play, and you can see that you can move the map around. And because we're applying the behavior to the nested elements, we could combine them. So we can have one scrolling horizontally and vertically, and then we can add a completely different behavior to the parent frame, for example. So let's add some vertical scrolling. So now, as you can see, this is still in place, but I can also scroll the entire content. So as you can see, applying this behavior to nested frames really unleashes the power of mixing different behavior in prototyping. Linking screens in Figma is actually really straightforward. So here I have a simple example. On this home screen, I have different colored shapes. And once I click on one of these colored shapes, I want it to jump to the detail page for each color. Make sure you're in prototype mode and then select any shape, frame, text, it doesn't matter. Once you hover over it, you'll see those little bubbles appearing. You can just pick any bubble. It doesn't matter which side you're selecting. Now drag out a connector and simply attach it to the frame that you want it to be connected with and let go. And that's it. Figma will automatically open the interaction details panel for you. And here you can further customize your interaction. You can do this right away. Or if it's closed, just click on the connector or directly on the interaction in the panel and it will open again. An interaction is always made up of a trigger, an action and a destination. So this is the top part of this panel here. On click is our trigger, then our action is navigate to, and the destination is our frame called orange. Now I can alter trigger, action, and destination simply by clicking on them. So I could swap the trigger from click to drag, hovering, mouse, enter, and so on. If we want to change screens, then it's usually going to be on click. So I'm going to leave it at this for now, and we're going to get to know the others later. My action is navigate to. Figma also gives me the option to swap overlays, close them and open them and so on. Go back, scroll to and open links. And we're going to have a look at this in a minute. Then the destination, I could also choose any other frame from this drop down. However, you'll notice as you're dealing with more frames, this is a bit tedious. So I prefer simply selecting my connector and then choosing another frame simply by moving it around. Below is the animation part. So this is how are things animated and behaving once the interaction is happening. Now, this is the fancy part, the part where you can set up all this magic behavior, things morphing into one another and so on. Now, we're going to have a more detailed look, especially into Smart Animate. However, just a word of caution. Micro interactions are really useful. However, I recommend that you first make sure that your actual connection and your usability is working and everything makes sense. And then later on with your development team, you can think about what animations and interactions you would like to add. Because what's sometimes just one click in Figma is actually quite difficult to set up in CSS. So just to have it a little smoother, I'm going to go for dissolve. Here you can set the time it takes to dissolve into another screen. And we could also choose one of the preset behaviors. I'm just going to leave it at ease out for now, which is pretty nice. So let's have a look at what that would look like in our preview. Um, I'm going to select the parent frame and I'm just going to add a mock-up around it. I'm working on an iPhone 14 size. Okay, so let's hit play. So here I see my home screen. And if I now click on my orange shape, I can see that it navigates to the sub page. 
However, if I'm clicking on back, then nothing is happening. So let's set up the other interactions as well. So let's jump back to our Figma file. And here, first of all, I'm going to connect the other two shapes. So I'm simply going to drag out a connector. And you can see that Figma saved the presets that I just used for the orange one. So this is really nice and helpful usually. Now, what I also want to do, if I click on back, I want to jump back onto the home screen. So it's the same on tap, navigate to home, and I can leave it at the same behavior. So I'm going to do that for the other two. Oh, and by the way, if you're wondering why it says tap and not click anymore, that's simply because I changed the device to iPhone. The action still works the same. So let's have a look at our prototype. And that is working just perfectly. Let's talk about the back action, because this can actually help you to majorly simplify your prototypes. So here I have an example where I click on one of the shapes and it then jumps to the detail page. If I want to go back, I have a back button at the top and that then again links back to the main page. Now that works just fine and you can absolutely use it like this, but there is a way that you can get rid of all of these extra connections. Let's select our back button here and then open our interaction menu. So here I can say on click. And by the way, if you set your prototype here, then this is going to change to on tab. Let me just show you. So that's exactly the same. It's just if you set a prototype, it's going to change the wording. So on click or on tab, instead of navigate to simply choose back from the action menu. So that's now going to jump back to the previously open frame. So let's have a look at this in our presentation mode. And I can see that if I click on here, I get a detail page. I click on back and I simply go back here. So the same as if I have a direct connection. Now a little tip, I could now either select all of them and manually change this to back, or I can simply delete the connections and then have this one here that I set up, copy it and simply paste the behavior onto any other element. This works because I'm in prototyping mode. If I was in design mode, I would simply copy the entire element. Now back is fantastic, but don't confuse it with a home button. Because as your design becomes more complex, there is different places that navigate to the same screen. Therefore, back is really there to always jump back to the last visited screen. And that's not necessarily your home screen. So, so far, we've only been linking outside to external frames, but we can also link to an element within the same frame. So in my example, let's just unclip the content. You can see that I have down here a black square. So what I want is that if I click on that black circle, that it scrolls down to the black square. So let's jump to a prototype mode. And then I am simply going to connect my circle, not with an outside screen, but with the square on the same frame. So in the interaction panel, you can see that on click. And again, this is the same as on tap. If you have a prototype set, scroll to. So this is simply an action here. And then scroll to me. I simply named the square scroll to me. And now here you have offsets that you can also set. And we're going to have a look why we need them in a second. And just as with any other, you can choose instant or animate. I'm going to go for animate because that's going to give it this nice little bounce that, you know, I'm going to leave it at ease out for now. Let's have a look at our preview mode. So if I click on the circle, it scrolls down to my black square. 
So a place where you're going to see this quite a bit is a one pager website where you have the navigation that doesn't link to separate pages, but to sections within the page. So let's just unclip the content here and you can see that it is quite a bit below. And here I have my about section and my new section. So what I want to do now is I want to take the about from the menu, jump to prototyping and then connect that navigation menu with the section. And I'm going to do the same for news. So let's have a look in our preview mode if that's going to work. So I click on about and that's scrolling down. And if I click on news, that's also working. But there's two things I don't like about this. First of all, I have a fixed menu. So this is sort of over like, covering my about section. Also, if I click on blog, I need to go up because I don't want to scroll back up. I want the same behavior. So back in my design, I first want to connect the blog. So I'm connecting blog with my card group here. Now I want to fix this offset. So I know I'm going to add some offset here, but I don't know the values yet. So in the about, my problem was the height of the menu. So let's check that. And the height here is 90. So let's jump to the menu. Let's go back into prototyping mode. And I'm going to add an offset of minus 90. And I need to add minus 90 and not 90 because otherwise it would push it further down. I want it to go up. So that's why I'm adding a negative value. And I'm going to do the same for news. And by the way, you can also hold shift and command and select multiple. So I could also just add the same value once here and then have that for both. Now with the blog, I don't want 90 because I basically wanted to jump back to the very top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to zoom in here a little bit and I'm going to measure how much this value is. So this is from the very top to my section starting is 220. So in this case, I'm going to add an offset of minus 220. So let's see if that works. So let's click on blog and yes, we're moving all the way up. Then about is nicely scrolling down and news is also working. Let's have a look at overlays in Figma. So a perfect example for an overlay is a menu. So it's basically its own frame, but if we click, for example, on work, we don't want the entire frame to change to this menu, but we want the menu to appear below our navigation here. We've pretty much set them up as any other connection. So let's select work, link over to the menu. And now on click, instead of navigate to, we choose open overlay. In the overlay menu, I can now choose the position. So center, top left, bottom, and so on in relation to the parent frame. Or I can also choose manual, which is what I would need here. I can now see this little preview of my overlay and I can position it on the frame as I need it. I can choose that it closes automatically when someone clicks outside. So any area around here. And I could add a background for a menu that doesn't really make a lot of sense. So I leave it. And as usual, I can choose my animation. So I'm going to have this also as the solve as usual. Okay, let's have a look what that will look like. Let's hit play. And I can see that if I click on work, my menu appears. And if I click again on work or anywhere else on the canvas, it's going to disappear again. So I can now simply connect any of these sub menus here to a new screen. Let's have a look at another example. When clicking on the subscribe button, I want to open an overlay that lets visitors subscribe to the newsletter. Okay, let's select the subscribe button and link it to the overlay and then on click open overlay. I want to keep it centered and I want it to close when clicking outside because I actually don't have a close icon here. I should have that for good usability, but we're going to go 
with just clicking outside for this exercise. And I also want to add a background. I'm actually going to have this a little darker, so at 50%. Okay, let's have a look. So here's my screen. I click on subscribe and my overlay opens. If I click anywhere else, it's going to close again. So now I have some more steps as my visitors add their email address. So as soon as someone clicks in here, I'm going to say, as soon as someone clicks into the address field, I'm going to pretend it's filled out. So I'm going to swap overlay with this overlay too. And then as soon as they click the go or the send button here, again, I'm going to swap overlay. And I just want this to go to this confirm screen here. So this just confirms that everything was sent, but I don't want the visitor to have to do another action. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to connect this for now back to here and say after delay, so no action required after delay of Let's say I'm um, just going to put two seconds. It's going to navigate back while I actually just going to set this to close this overlay. OK, let's have a look if that works. So I click on subscribe. Then I add my email, go. And after two seconds, the overlay is gone. There's just one thing I don't like. If I click here, if I swap the overlay, you can see these little flashes. And this is because here I am using the solve and there is a delay of 300 milliseconds. So I'm going to swap this to instant. And now let's go back and have a look. And that should solve it. Perfect. Overlay done. With Figma prototyping, you cannot only link to other pages in your design, but also to external pages. So let's say in my navigation, everything links within my design, except the blog here. I want to link that to an external existing blog. So one way I could do this is simply select this. If it's a text element, then click on the link up here and paste the URL. If I have a look at this in presentation mode, you can see that it's now a link. And if I click on it, it opens the actual website. If you want to have another link style, and that is no problem, simply select a text and then via your text menu, you can alter it to your needs. Now, this works quite well for text. But the thing is that if I, for example, have another element, let's say I have this card that I want to link to a blog article, then I don't have the option to link it because it's not a text. What I could do is use my prototyping menu. So with this card selected, let's jump into the prototyping tab. Now here I'm going to click on plus next to interaction. So this is opening a new interaction. If I click on that again, it opens their interaction window. Now I'm going to leave this at click for now, but you can already see that this also gives me the advantage that I could open an external link with any other action, such as pressing a specific key on my keyboard, mouse enter and so on. And then for the direction, I'm going to add open link at the very bottom of my menu. And now here I can simply copy the link I wanted to open. So in presentation mode, if I click on this card, I'm now going to be redirected to the external page. And by the way, this also works the other way around. You can also copy the prototyping share link. You can either do that via the menu or simply press command and L and then link back from any external page to your prototype. This is also a really good way to link prototypes that are in different files or on different pages. Let's have a closer look at the different triggers for animation. So here we have our standard setup that we have also been using so far and it just works perfectly if we just want to set up a clickable prototype. So here we use on click and we navigate to a new destination, which would be our detail screen. Now with this little drop down here, we can see other options. So on drag is something that in this case, wouldn't make a lot of sense. 
So on drag is something you find a lot on mobile screens. So here, for example, we have this switch between articles and videos, and therefore I'm using on drag. So if I drag over here, then I'm going to see the screen. And this is usually combined with a push animation, something we're going to learn more about later on. So in action, it will be something like this. I would drag to one side, get the videos and drag over here to get the articles. And then we have a lot of interactions like mouse enter, mouse leave, mouse down, mouse up, and also while hovering and while pressing would be part of that. So this is really all your different interactions with the mouse. Let's just say mouse enter and then navigate to that new screen that would also work here. So as I enter, I jump to the new screen, but it wouldn't make a lot of sense. So a place where you would use this and we're going to have a whole chapter on this is interactive components. So here I have a component set with two variants, a button. And then I say while hovering, or let's just say mouse enter. Let's actually use while hovering. I am using smart animate here, which is also something we're going to cover later on. And you'll see that it doesn't navigate, but it changes too because it's inside of this component set. I can now pull out an instance. Let's just draw a frame around it so that we can see it better. And now as we hit play, you can see that here is my button. And as I hover over it in and out, it has this nice little hover effect. A trigger that's used very little, but it's actually very impressive is the keyboard trigger. So to show you an example, here I have a search bar and on click that's going to be filled in. That's also something we would usually solve with interactive components, but let's just stay with a simplified version for now. So now I'm selecting this filled in form now. And now as I hit enter, I want this to go to the result. So what I can say is instead of on click, I say key or gamepad. And now simply select this field here and then press any um, key on your keyboard and it's going to save it. So in my case, enter, I could have also pressed a for example. And then it will navigate here and you can also choose the animation. So let's have a dissolve animation. So let's see this in action here. I click on search. Now I have it filled in. And now as I press enter on my keyboard, which you don't see, it's giving me the test results. The last one I want to show you is after delay. And you might not always have this for every situation, but if so, then you find it down here after delay. And this basically simply moves from this screen to this screen after delay. And this becomes a really powerful when later we'll learn about smart animate. So let's have a look here. We can set the speed. Let's set this to two seconds so that we can really see our delay and let's press play. So you can see it takes its delay and then changes the screen. And this is also really nice because you can chain it so you can have different actions or you can also set up something like a newsletter prompt that would pop up after a certain amount of time. Let's go through the different animations that we have available in Figma. Let's start with the first one, which is instant. And this is actually your default animation. I actually don't use this one quite a lot, but a good example where I use it is a tooltip. So here I have an info icon. So if I hover over it, so let's say while hovering, I want to open an overlay and I'm going to have this open at instant. Let me just position my overlay here. And now let's have a look. So as I would hover over this, it would instantly show up. And I like this to be instant and not have a delay because think about how fast people move their mouse around. So you really want them to notice that there is something more to explore. Now, the one that I probably use most is the second one. So this is here on my list, Dissolve. The Dissolve will slowly fade in the new frame. You'll also notice that you get more options. You can choose the way it eases in and out and also the time that it will take. So if I set this one here, so this is milliseconds, let's set it to 5000. So it would be super slow. Um, and let's have a look at this. So let's click on it. And you can see this really slow transition happening to the new page. 
Now, when you start adding animations to change pages, it's very tempting to add a high number here and make it look a little more magic. But especially when navigating between different pages, I recommend that you leave it somewhere around this default setting of 300. Because think about how people navigate your page. They quickly want to jump to different sections. So it's going to be a real obstacle to always wait for a slow transition. Let's have a look what else we have here. The next one is Smart Animate, and this is the big magic one. Smart Animate looks for matching layers between your original frame and the final destination, and it recognizes the change and then applies a seamless animation. Because it's so powerful and a really big deal when it comes to animation in Figma, I have a whole separate chapter about Smart Animate. But just to give you a little preview, Let's take this frame and duplicate it because we need really identical frames. And then what I'm going to do here, this is set up an auto layout and I'm just going to stack those images here. So I'm going to select this entire group, connect it with the frame. And if I click on it, I want to navigate to the other frame with Smart Animate. And I set this a little higher at 800 so we can see it properly. So let's press play. And I can see here my stacked images. If I click them, there's a nice transition. And you can smart animate between different colors, different sizes, positions, and it's really, really powerful. Let's look at our last transition, and this is the moving transitions. And you find them down here. We have move in, move out, push, slide in, and slide out. So notice how with those moving transitions, you have this little arrows on the right hand side and you can choose which way you want them to move in. So from the top, from the bottom, left or right. Move in and move out. They basically slide the frame in and out of the view. So this is really nice for creating hierarchy. Push is really similar to move in and out, but it pushes the frame on the same level. Slide in and slide out is very similar again. However, it will slightly offset the frames as it dissolves while move keeps it stationary. Best is to just play around with them. Let's have a look at the different easing and spring animations. Easing determines the acceleration of a transition between two keyframes. This could be the transition from one screen to another or a transition between single objects. So for example, changing color or size when you're clicking. You'll see that transitions are usually represented by graphs, whereby time is the x-axis and the transition, such as move in or slide or whatever you're using, is the y-axis. Linear is the default acceleration and it's just a straight line on your graph. So this means it will just move in a constant speed. Figma has many inbuilt presets that you can use. If we move from linear to ease in, for example, you can see that now the animation starts slowly and then accelerates towards the end. So here I have an overview of all the inbuilt animations in Figma. So these are basically just instances and you can see that I set them all up down here. Let's have a look here at this example, ease in and out. So I set the trigger to after delay and then it will smart animate and it will use the ease in and out animation. And I just set one second so we can see it a little better. And once that is done, the same is happening backwards again. Okay, let's jump back to our overview that we find up here. And I'm simply going to select this frame and press play. Now let's just make sure that we set this to fit width so we can see all of them. And now you can see all the different animations next to each other. There is not one animation that's right or wrong. It's really about what you're trying to build. What do you see down here? Gentle, quick, bouncy and slow are actually the so-called spring animations. The difference between easing and spring animation becomes a little clearer when we have a look at the custom options in Figma. So here you can see at the last easing transition, we get a custom bezier. And if we pick that, you can see that here you get the curve that you can now adjust to your needs. But it's really always going to be this curve. 
Now further down in my examples, I have the spring animations and I have the custom spring. So let's have a look at this. I can adjust the stiffness, which is the number of sort of bounces that the animation can be adjusted to. I can adjust the damping, which influences the level of spring in the animation. And I can influence the mass. This would influence the speed of the animation and the height of the bounce. So we can really pull this curve and add a lot of bounce and a lot of movement here. Let's have a look what that looks like in our preview mode. So you can see you get this nice little bouncing at the end of it. The best way to master them is as usual, get ready and explore. Sections in Figma are a great way to organize our design better and create stateful design. Let's have a look at what that means. So in my example here, I have a home screen and on that home screen, I can press a sign up button that then leads me through an overlay with the registration process. So I can choose which plan I want to have, add my personal details, choose a payment method, and then in the end, it's all confirmed. Let's have a look at the actual prototype. So here's the home. I click on sign up. I can then choose any plan. I add my details. I sign up, choose a payment, and it's confirmed. Now that seems all fine. But let's say I'm starting the process and then within the process, at some point, I am closing my overlay. Now, after a while, I want to come back and finish my registration. However, if I click here, I'm always going to be redirected to the very first screen. Now, I don't want this. I want to go back to this screen where I left and keep all the information I already added. This is called stateful design. However, if we have a look at our file, then there is no way that Figma can remember where I left. There is, however, a way around this, and this is where sections come in. You find sections up here under the frames menu, or you can simply use a shortcut Shift S. Just like a frame, you can draw a section around a group of frames. We can now name the section, let's call it registration. And if you jump over to the design tab, you could also change the color of the section. As you will see here, you get some basic features, but there is no things like auto layout constraints and other features that you would see with frames. So sections are really there for purely organizing. Sections are also ignored by presentation mode. So if I choose the section and press play, then it's always going to show me the first screen within the section. Okay, great. Now we only need to make a few adjustments. So let's jump back to prototyping. And what I want to do is I don't want this sign up here to connect to the first screen, but I want it to connect to the entire section. So I'm setting up a new connector and I'm saying on tab, navigate to, and I'm leaving this at navigate to the section. I need to use navigate to open overlay with a section will not work, even though within the section, I can keep on using overlays. And now one last little thing I need to do, which is a little confusing, is that I need to select all my close buttons here. And I'm going to change them from close overlay to back. This is going to allow me to jump back to my original screen. You could also just connect them directly with the screen. That is no problem. So let's have a look at the prototype. So here we have our home. We sign up, we choose any plan, fill in our details. And then here at payment, we close. And then after a while we go back. And you can see that it remembers the exact state where we left and we can just carry on from here. So now that we're working on our app and we're adding more areas, we might have more sign up button from other places, but that is no problem. We can just connect them to the same section. Now, the only thing we need to change is that once we finish the process, we might not want to go back to home, but we might also 
just want to have this set to back and therefore jump back to any frame that we came from. Let's have a look if that's working. So here I'm starting the sign up process from home. I already added some details, but then I'm closing my overlay. I navigate further in my app and then from some other place I'm going back and you can see that it remembers where I left. And so I can just finish from here. You can create multiple flows in Figma to focus on different segments of your prototype. It's very easy. Let me show you. If you have any design set up with connections, then you will find at least one flow there. Figma automatically sets up your first flow as soon as you draw your first connector. You can simply select that flow and attach it to any other frame you like. Note that it doesn't attach to sections, but only to frames. You can double click the flow to rename it. You can also select any other frame and then simply in the prototyping panel on the top, click on plus and add another flow. Let's call this one home. If you click anywhere on your canvas while in prototyping mode, you can see an overview of your flows down here. So right now we have registration and home and note the order. So let's press play and see what that does to our prototyping. Now on the left hand side, you have a little menu that you can show or hide. And here the first flow is registration. So it's going to show me this screen first. If I click on home, then I'm getting to the home screen. I can still access my prototype just as I did before. But this enables our users, or if you're doing user testing, to jump to different regions of your prototype. Note how we can also add descriptions. This is really handy for testing. It's a little hidden. So back in our design file, select any flow, and then you get this little edit description icon on the right hand side. If you click on that, you can add text. So now let's jump back to prototyping and you can see that our comment was adding to this specific flow. Back in our file, if you click on the canvas, you can also reorder all of your flows. So we could have home, for example, first. If you click on the little select frame, then it's going to jump and show you this flow. This is really handy if you have a lot of flows set up. Another thing is that you can share a direct link to your flow. So if you want someone to open directly, for example, in the registration process, then you can just copy the flow directly from here. Also, if you click on play in a presentation, then it's going to jump directly to this specific flow. So flows are a really great way to add a bit of structure to your prototype. So if you're directly sharing from prototyping, then it helps visitors to understand the different sections of your design. And also with comments, you can guide them through general testing. In Figma, you can embed videos. Just be aware that this only works on a paid pro plan. So in your design, just choose any fill and then via the fill menu, Select from the drop down video. You will see a preview image of the video and you'll see the little video thumbnail in your layers panel. For this to work, your video should be in an MP4 format. GIFs also work, by the way, and it should not exceed 30 megabytes. As videos are simply layer fills, you can also alter them just as you would with any other layer fill. So you can change the size, you can add other elements on top, you can use mask, crop and so on. To see the video being played, you need to jump into presentation mode. To change the play settings, select the video, jump into the prototyping panel, and then here under video, you can choose whether it auto plays or not, whether it should loop, and you can choose whether sound should be played or not. To save yourself some frustration, be aware that currently videos are not supported on the Figma mobile app. Figma has a fantastic app that lets you preview your prototypes on your mobile. 
go to the Figma website and under Products, you find the tab Downloads. Within Downloads, you can either download the iOS or Android version of the app to your phone. Once you open the mobile app, you're prompted to log in. For the login, just use your standard Figma login. It's actually important that you use the exact same login as you do for your working files, otherwise Mirror is not going to work. You will then see an overview of the files on your account. However, have a look at the bottom right and click on Mirror. Once you click on Begin Mirror, this will mirror any frame that you select at this moment in your desktop app. Any prototype settings will automatically be visible here. So I love having this open while working on my mobile designs. This allows me to see and test my design in a more realistic way while designing. Just make sure that you check that the size of the frame you're designing on is actually the correct size for the mobile phone that you're using. So in my case, I have a physical iPhone 14. Therefore, my screen is also set to those dimensions. The app will scale up and down your design, so it will look real even if you're using another size. However, this can really lead to errors when it, for example, comes to testing touch target sizes. You can also share your mobile prototypes via the link. Make sure that you copy the link from the presentation view. It will then automatically open in the Figma mobile app if installed on a phone. Again, make sure that here the size of your prototype corresponds with the physical size of the phone being used. You don't need to worry about resolution in this case because the link goes back to Figma, which takes care of that. Let's have a look at the magic part of prototyping with Figma, and that is no doubt Smart Animate. So what Smart Animate does is that it takes matching layers between different frames and then recognizes the differences and animates between them. So let's play with this a little. So here I have two frames and I'm simply going to connect them by setting Smart Animate to 2000 milliseconds. So two seconds that we can really see the animation and I am returning the favor so we can click between them. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how we can change the position. So I'm simply moving my shapes. Now let's click presentation mode and you can see that they will nicely animate to their new position. Okay, let's have a look at what else we can do. The other thing we can do is that we can change the size. So I'm just going to drag this a little smaller down here. And I'm also going to make some changes here. I'm going to just enlarge this triangle and squeeze it a little bit. And now yeah, I'm going to leave it like this. And now let's have a look. So now I'm going to click on my square and you can see that they're not only changing position, but also adapting in size. Now, obviously, the thing that we also want to change is the color and we can simply change the fill anywhere between our different frames here and it will smart animate between the new color. So let's click here and you can see the color softly changing from one color to the other. We can also adapt the rotation and this is a really nice effect that you can use. Just make sure to not overuse this effect. Let me adjust this a little bit and let's have a look. So you get this really nice twisting. And one last little thing that's really handy is if you want something to seem like it appears from nothing then set it to zero. You do need it on the first screen, otherwise it's not going to work. But if you set it to zero, then it seems like it's appearing from nowhere. So in Figma, fancy animations such as this are actually really simple to achieve. And this is in Figma, not in CSS. So all we really need for this is, for example, for this twisting menu, is that here we have a menu with two lines and then our cross is made up of the exact two same lines simply turned around and made a little longer at one end. 
then our background that appears is simply a hidden background. Let me just change the opacity here and you can see that this is simply a square that is growing into a larger background and I made this invisible and therefore it seems like it's appearing from nothing. Then our links that appear to slide in from the left, if I unclip then you can see that they're on the frame but they're moved outside of the visible area and with animation they're simply moved back onto the frame into that position. So all that we need to do now is jump to prototyping and then connect this menu here with our new screen and we leave it on click smart animate and I have one second here and then if I click on the menu again it's going to jump back to the original frame. And that's all I need to set up this fancy animation. We can also combine Smart Animate with moving transitions. In my example here, you see two screens, one containing all articles and the other one containing all videos. On the top, there is a filter. Now, what I want to happen is that if someone swipes to the left, then the videos are displayed. And if they're swiping to the right, then we're going back to the articles. So I'm going to select the article page and then drag out a connector and I'm going to say on drag and I want this to be pushed in. I could use move in actually, but I'm going to go for pushed in this case. And now I have to consider I'm pushing to the left. So I want this to move into the left. Now from here, I'm going to do the same and I'm going to connect this and I'm going to say on drag and now I want to push to the right and then show articles again. So let's have a look in our presentation mode what that would look like. So I am dragging to the left and I have my videos and if I drag back my articles. So that looks pretty nice. But what I don't like is that the top here, my filters are also swapping. I actually want them to stay in place and simply activate the corresponding filter. So if I jump back to my design here and select my connection, you can see that as soon as I choose a moving selection, you can see that I get this little tick box here called Smart Animate Matching Layers and I'm going to activate this. And I need to do the same for the connection going back to my articles. So let's have a look what happens now. So if I now swipe, you can see that my menu is Smart Animating. The rest of my design is still using the moving animation. For this to work, make sure that you check two things. First of all, the elements that you want to smart animate, for example, in my case, the filters are set up exactly the same. So they use the same hierarchy and they use the exact same naming. The part that I don't want to smart animate is named differently. So this group is called articles and this group, which is actually quite similar in setup and structure is called videos. So Smart Animate is real magic, but it comes with a few limitations. So as we learned, we can animate color, size, position, rotation, and so on. But what we cannot animate is going from one shape to a different shape. So here I drew a square and here I drew a circle. And now let's see what would happen if I would Smart Animate this. So you can see as I click it, it still does animate nicely, but it doesn't really grow into the new shape. In this specific case, there's a little trick I could use. So I could simply select the square, copy it, and then let's paste it here again. And so instead of just drawing a circle, I'm going to turn this square into a circle. So I'm going to use round corners to do that. And now let's just change the color so we can see this a little better. And let's jump back into presentation mode. So now as I click, you can see this is working. 
but it is only gonna work for a square turning into a circle. If I would want to turn this into a star or into a triangle or anything else, that would not work. What might also cause you trouble is if you change the naming. So here I have two frames holding a group and a frame. So this one here is the frame, this one here is the group, and they have identical content. If I smart animate that, then you can see that works perfectly. Now let's go back and change the naming. So I'm going to call this one here group X and I'm going to call this frame here frame Y, frame Z. And now let's play again. So even though the hierarchy and everything, all the naming inside the group stayed the same, they're not recognized as the same anymore. And that's also the case if I keep the group and the frame names the same, but change the name of the content. So let's just add a little X here at the back for each of them. And now you can see as I animate again, the group itself animates, but not the content. So you need the same hierarchy and naming for everything to match. A little trick, if you want to see if things are set up in the same naming and hierarchy convention to be smart animated, simply select any element and you will see in the other frames, which one would be matching. So here you can see this one is now matching. Now, if I change the naming and we select it again, you can see that's now not matching anymore. Let's return to the original name. And now it's picking up. So this is a really nice way, especially if you have hundreds of screens to quickly check if something is out of order. Another limitation that you might encounter is that when you're opening an overlay, then you cannot smart animate this shape. So for example, here, everything is called ellipse one and it's all the same shape. But once I say on click open overlay, you can see that in the animation menu, I can choose between instant and dissolve, but I cannot select smart animate. So when opening an overlay, I cannot grow this bubble into the bubble on the overlay. However, once the overlay is open and I am dealing with swapping overlay, you can see that now Smart Animate is active. So let me show you. So here I have my home screen. I click on my circle and it will open the overlay, but it won't Smart Animate. Now, however, I'm on the overlay, I'm just swapping overlays and you can see that now Smart Animate is working. Another area that might cause you trouble is background fills with moving animations. So here I have a simple example. If I click on this red rectangle, then it moves this detail page in. And if I click on X, then it moves it back out. And note how I don't have Smart Animate activated yet. So let's have a look what that would look like. So if I click here, that moves it in, click on X, moves it out. Seems pretty nice. But what I want to do now is if I click here, I want the X to stay in place and be smart animated with the menu. So that's very simple. I simply select my connectors and set smart animate. So simply tick that little box here. But if I now play it again, you can see that it works for the menu, but I'm having this strange transparency happening in my transition. To fix this, let's go back here and select the target page. And then I am simply going to press R and draw a rectangle as sort of a second background. And um, you can also name this. The best is to name this sort of background animation so people don't get confused about it. And now let's have a look again. So I press play. And now you can see that now it's working perfectly. So this is just a little trick you have to use to make background transitions work with Smart Animate. So let's sum up. You can Smart Animate color, size, position, rotation, and you can combine Smart Animate with moving animations. You can not Smart Animate into another shape. So for example, a rectangle into a star. You can not Smart Animate when opening a new overlay. Make sure you have the same naming and hierarchy for Smart Animate to kick in. 
and be aware that background fills with Moving Transition and Smart Animate will not animate automatically. Let's put what we've learned into practice and let's build this photo filtering app with Smart Animate. But let's start from scratch. So here we have the screens that we're going to start off with. We have a home screen with a filter and images as well as a menu and a detail screen. So what I first want to set up is a splash screen. So I'm going to copy the home screen over here and I am actually going to get rid of everything except my menu. Now I'm selecting my menu. I press the K button for scaling. You can also open scaling from the menu up here. And now I'm going to scale this menu button up and place it in the middle. I'm going to select the menu strokes and I'm going to set them to zero. So this is going to look like they're going to like sort of fade in with the animation. Now, the other thing I want to do is I'm going to copy this again. And here on my very first screen, I'm going to twist this. And now I'm going to chain this into a animation. So I'm going to jump to prototyping and I'm going to take this first screen here, connect it and then say after delay, because this is a splash screen. So I want this to start automatically and I'm going to set it to smart animate and I'm going to leave it at this transition of 1.5 seconds that I have from another animation before and I'm going to do the same here. So now let's have a look what that will look like. Let's press play. And you can see the splash screen turning. And actually we have to go back here. Let's see why this is not jumping over here. So this is still set to tap. So let's set this to after delay and then let's have a look again. And now it should be working. So it's turning and then it's moving up and my menu is appearing. Okay, great. Okay, next thing. So the next thing I want to set up is my filters. So I'm going to first of all take this screen and I'm going to set my scrolling behavior. So let's have a look. If I set a vertical scrolling, so let's have a look what that would look like. So this would move the entire screen except my menu, which I fixed. However, I don't really want this. I only want this part to scroll. So there's different ways that you could approach this. If you had more content down here, then it would make sense to actually fix this upper part as a header. However, as I only have the images, I might as well take off the scrolling from my main frame and then set up scrolling on this part here. Now remember for scrolling to work and you can see I already get an error here. I need the frame to be smaller than the content. So I can resize this and just be a little careful because I actually have this set up as auto layout. So sometimes it's behaving strangely and you might manually have to change it from hug to fixed height. In this case, it's working quite well. So now if I jump back to my preview, you can see that this is now having the behavior that I'm after. Okay, great. Let's set up the rest of the filters. So I'm copying over two more pages. Let's make some space here. And then let's have a look. Okay, so what I want to do now is on this one, I want to activate latest. So I'm setting this to 100% and I am going to move this little bar over here and I'm setting this to 50. And I'm going to do the same for the last one here, set the active one to 100%, then the inactive one to 50. You can simply press the number and then it will as you can see here, turn it into the percentage. And I'm also going to move this bar because I'm using the same bar. It's just going to move around once I use smart animate on this navigation. I also want to change the way the images are shuffled. So I need to select those ones here 
and unclip so I can see them all. And now the great thing is as they're set up with auto layout, I can simply select an image and with the up and down key, I can move them around. So let's do the same for the last screen and just shuffle them randomly. Mm, let's move this one up here. Okay, great. Now be aware, we just unclipped all of this content. So if I now jump into preview mode and I scroll, then you will get this scrolling behavior. So make sure that you select them all again and clip the content again. Now let's do the same again. And you can see now the behavior is working again. Okay, so now what we want to do is we want to set up the connections. So if I click on latest, I want it to jump over here and I want to use smart animate. And I'm going to leave this also at quite a slow animation so that we can see it properly. Now I'm going to do the same for popular and I have to do it with those screens as well. So jump back to show all from here, go to popular and in my last screen, the same. Well, actually, this one goes to the first one. And then this one will go over here. OK, so let's have a look if that's working. So this is set up entirely in Smart Animate and you can see that not only the navigation here or our filters are working nicely, but also our images are being reshuffled. We could also the speed a little bit, but I'm going to leave it for now so that we can see it better. So the last bit we're missing now is our detail page over here. And what I want here is I want some images in a preview. Then I have my text and I want a little closing button. There is different ways that you could set this up. So also feel free to play with it yourself. Okay, let's start with our images. So I'm taking this here and I am copying the images. I'm deleting this placeholder and I'm pasting them on here. But I want them to be stacked horizontally. So as this is set up with auto layout, I'm simply changing the direction. Let's unclip the content so we can see it better. And I can set this to a hug. And now we have all the images here in a row. I don't want to display all of them, just a few. So I'm going to delete these ones here. And now in order to set this up as horizontal scroll, I have to make the frame smaller. And this is what I was talking about. Sometimes this will be a little strange. And this is because we're working with auto layout. So what we can do is we can set a horizontal to fixed. And now we can adjust it. In this case, I also have to change the alignment. And now I can change this. I actually want to adapt um, the spacing a little bit so we can see that there is more content coming for scrolling. Actually, let's set this back Oop, over here. And I am adding a little bit of a padding to the left. Now I'm selecting this frame and I'm jumping to prototype and notice how this is giving me an error because obviously there is no vertical um, content to scroll. So as soon as I change this to horizontal scrolling, now it's going to work. So let's have a look if that's doing what we wanted to do. So here's my content and I can horizontally scroll this. Okay, great. Now I want to add my button here and I want this to be not a menu anymore, but a closing button. So I copied it over and what I'm going to do is I'm going to select, uh, I have to jump to, I'm still in prototyping mode. I need to go to design and now I am adjusting these lines from a menu to an X or so to a closing sign. So what we want to do now, we want to connect this image to open the detail page. So let's jump to prototype and then let's select this 
and go over here. But what I don't want actually, I don't want all of this to smart animate. I want this to be pushed in or moving, I'm going to choose. And I'm still going to keep smart animate here selected because I want the menu to smart animate. Now let's see if that works. And little hint, it will not, but I'm going to show you why. So let's pray. Let's press play. And then I am pressing this detail and it's actually looking nice, but it's smart animating everything here. I don't want this. So why is it doing this? So you can see here that this group is called images and this group here is called images and actually has a very similar order. So I need to change the name here. So I'll call it, I'm going to call this images um, detail. So now let's have a look again. So now let's press on that image again. And you can see that now it's moving in, but it's doing this weird thing like this weird, weird transparency and actually it's not closing. So let's fix that as well. Okay. So first of all here, let's add an interaction and let's say on tab, go back to wherever you came from, because we're going to connect some more images here. And then the other thing that we want to do is here, I actually wanted this to move up, but it had this strange transparency. So what you need to do here is you need to draw a separate background. So I'm drawing a white um, background here and I'm simply going to add white and move this. So it's a sort of a, an extra background into in my order here, my stacking order to the very back. So this is really only there for sorting out this little weird transparency with my animation. Okay, so let's have a look if that is working. Let's press play. And now that looks just great. And if I press the X, have a look how nice that animation is working. So here we have our moving animation. And as we still have um, smart animate set within the moving animation, our menu that has the same naming and the same hierarchy is working with smart animate. So let's have a look and set up our final design. So the only thing I want to do now is let, let's unclip those here again. And let's actually look for this image. I'm going to move it up a little bit. And now I also want to connect this to our detail page. So here that still has the animation that we set before. And from here, I am also joining this. And then I'm gonna clip those again. A little extra tip. Sometimes you might want to have elements stacked and then opening up. So you can also do that if this is set up with auto layout. Now I can go down here and set the value to a negative value, then my images are stacking. And you will see now how on one screen they're stacked. And once we choose any other screen, then they're going to open up. Okay, so I think our app is finished. Let's run through the entire setup. So we have our splash screen. That's moving up here, turning into an animation. So here you can see our stacking. And once I go to any other filter, you can see that it's unstacking. And then we can click on our image and we get our detail page, which we can open and close. So we can also access this detail page from any other point of our app. And because this is set to back, it's also going to go back to the page where we came from. So as we can see, it only took us 10 minutes to set up this entire Smart Animate app. Now it's easy to get carried away with Smart Animate in Figma because it's just so easy and amazing. But always animate with purpose and code in mind. So let's make sure we remember a few important things. One, we design for purpose. So every decision we make in our design should have a purpose and guide our visitors. Animation, especially micro interactions, such as hover states for a button and so on, play a really important role in our user experience. Let me give you an example. So the principle of common fate. 
That means that two or more elements behaving the same way are perceived as part of a unit. Think of an accordion. If I click, I want this to open, and I click again and it closes. I've learned that it works this way, and I clicked on one, so I expect all of the rest here to work exactly the same. So it'd be really confusing if I clicked on one and suddenly an overlay would open. And that's the same for all elements you're using. So all buttons on your page should look and behave exactly the same way. Two, don't overdo it. I know Smart Animate is flashy and magic, but don't overdo it. Don't just add a little bit here and a little bit there because everybody says wow when you use it. Too much will actually be disencouraging and contribute to your visitor's cognitive overload. Make sure your design works in a simple clickable prototype at all times. And that does not mean that animation should be an afterthought. Think of a scrollable menu. I can click and then jump to the section. So that works. Now I can add a smooth scrolling animation guiding my visitors to this section. This helps me to understand where I am and how to get back. So it really improves my design. Do I need elements flying in and out while it animates there? Probably not. Smart Animate is not code. And this is really, really an important one. For several reasons. For example, what might be really easy in just one click with Figma Smart Animate might actually be really difficult if you're using something like CSS animation. And also the other way around. There might be great possibilities out there that you simply cannot show in Figma. So that doesn't mean that you need 20 meetings about every hover state or clickable box that you're designing with Smart Animate. However, it's a good idea that before you start to check in with your development team, ask if there's a person responsible for animation and you can plan together from the beginning. Also ask if they're using a specific animation library and you can familiarize with the documentation and get realistic idea from the library showcase. So far, we've used animation between different frames. And now I'm going to show you one of my favorite features, interactive components. They're basically reusable animations set inside your component. So as the name states, for this to work, we need components or rather component sets with variants inside. If you're not familiar with this, a variant set is basically two components, two or more components actually. And you can see here I use the naming convention button forward slash default, button forward slash hover. So they're of the same family, they're just a different state of the same thing really. And then over here on the right hand side, I can say combine as variants. And the great thing about this is if I now pull out an instance here, then you can see that within this button, both instances are just saved as different states. So across my design, I'm going to use many instances of those elements. So I can not only save the different states they have within this instance, but I can also save the behavior. So I need to be on my prototype settings. And then for example, to save a button behavior, so a hover state I want to add, I'm simply connecting my two buttons as I would do before with any other frame. And now you can see that in my menu, it says on click, or I'm going to change this to uh, while hovering, and it has change to set. So this change to here is only going to be active within component sets. Now I can use instant dissolve or smart animate. I'm going to use smart animate as it's simply a color. Now let's have a look what this does. So that we can view this in our preview mode, I need to draw a frame. And I can now add an instance of my button to this frame. Now let's have a look. As I hover over my button, you can see that I have this behavior saved here. And this is going to be the same wherever I use this button. Okay, now I want the same for my switch here, but I want this to be dragged over here and then turn into this switch. Now in this case, I don't want the entire switch to be activated, but I want to take this little bubble here. So I want to take, select this bubble, draw out an animation, and you'll see it will say on click. In this case, I want on drag, change to, and I'm going to smart animate it over here. 
Now, in this case, I need to return the favor. So on drag, it's going to turn back into my original state. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to drag out an instance, place it on my frame, and let's have a look if that works. So here is my toggle. I drag it and you can see that it changes the color with Smart Animate. Now I can animate between more than just two. So here I have this checkbox and I'm going to drag out a connector and I'm going to say on click change to Smart Animate to this. And then from here, I'm going to say go over here. And if I check again, then it's going to go back to the beginning. Let's drag out an instance of this checkbox. I'm actually going to drag out a few. And now let's have a look. So if I play this, let's make this larger. I can check it if I press again. It's like this. And so I can use this across my design. Just like with any other component, you can nest animated components and combine them. So here I have my button and my switch. If I go to prototype, you can see that they already have their animation set up. And then I have another component, a list component. And what I can do now, let's just drag over any instance from this toggle switch. And I'm now creating an instance of my list item here. So you can see that this switch is nested. So if I click on the original component, it jumps back and shows me the nested animated component or variant in that case. And I can now just drag out a few. And let's combine this into a frame. You can actually right click and then go to frame this selection. So let's add some content and let's also add an instance of our button down here, just need a background fill. Then let's add this down here. And then I can, of course, overwrite this. Let's add some images with the Unsplash plugin. I'm just going to go for some portraits here. And now let's have a look and play this. And so now you can see that I can individually adjust those toggle buttons and also my button is working. So interactive components are also a great helper when it comes to creating hover states. Where before we needed to create many frames, we can now simply add the animation to our component and any override will inherit that behavior. So here I have my card default and a hover state. So now I'm going to simply in my prototyping menu, add while hover change to and smart animate. And I'm now going to drag out instances of that card. I can now override the images and the text. For the images, I'm using the unsplash plugin, but you can use any. Let's have a look at this. So you can see that as I hover, they all inherit the default and hover state. But I can still add some more magic here because remember, I can also smart animate size. So all I'm doing is that in the default, I leave the image at its original size. And then over here on my hover state, I'm just going to slightly enlarge the image and change the position. And now let's have a look what happens. As I hover, I'm getting this really nice little zoom in on the images. Working with interactive component when it comes to hover states is going to save you a lot of time. Beforehand, to create a simple hover carousel like this, you needed this amount of screens. Because every state, so every time this would enlarge, we would otherwise have to create an own page and then link back and forth. Now, all we need is this. Because what we have here is we have an interactive component that has an animation of while hovering change to. And then here we have simply instances that enlarge. Note, if you want to use images that enlarge by using Smart Animate with interactive components and then next to one another, you need to add auto layout. So here you can see I have an auto layout around this. That means when 
this image here enlarges, then it's going to push all the other images out of the way. Another great thing is, let's say I want to add something to all of those instances, then I can simply add this to my variant here and it's then going to be represented on all of them. So let's play this again and you can see that I have the plus. The only thing I don't like, it's sort of disappearing in a strange way instead of simply dissolving. So remember with Smart Animate, Figma is looking for the same elements in hierarchy and naming from the start to the end. So that's exactly the same between frames or within component sets. So let's copy just this layer that I called cross and let's also add it to our destination even though we don't want to show it here. Let's adjust the size to fit and I'm going to set this to zero, only the cross. Okay, let's play this again. And now you can see the cross is nicely disappearing because the smart animate is working within the component set. One place where interactive components become especially powerful is if we combine them with auto layout. So here I have a component set with two frames, a red one and a blue one of different size. Now I'm just going to pull over some instances here and I'm going to place them on my frame over here. And now I'm going to add some prototyping. So if I click on the red one, then I say change to and smart animate into the blue shape. And I'm going to return this from the blue shape to the red one. So on click, change to red and smart animate. Now let's have a look what that looks like. And so far there is no auto layout applied anywhere. So you can see that if I click, then it changes. And you can see that here it becomes larger, but they sort of run into each other. And if I click again, then they go back to the original shape. And the Smart Animate is working within this click animation. However, let's have a look what happens if I select all of them. And now in design, I am turning that into an auto layout frame. Let's actually move that frame up a little bit and give it some more space and you'll see why in a minute. And now let's press play. So now you can see my frame here and as I click, you can see that it shifts up and down. And the reason is that remember auto layout always takes up all the available space. And this is how I can smart animate and make other content respect the new size. And I can really take this to the extreme. So let's say that I am setting this blue shape here to zero. And notice how Figma never gives me zero. It always just gives me this um, one here. So a little trick around it is go 0 0.004 or something like this. And then it's going to go to zero. So it's still here, my element, but it's hidden. So now let's play again. And now you can see that if I click on this red one here, then they disappear. The only thing is you probably wonder if you can add a little plus button or add again and then add them. Well, that's not really going to work because theoretically they're all here and Figma doesn't remember which one you just clicked and which one you didn't. You could, however, simulate it. So you could add, let's say, let's just add a little round button here and say this is the plus button. So what we could do is we could say um, once they're deleted and I click on this one, I'm simply going to copy the same version of the already existing one here and then I'm going to connect this. So on click navigate to and smart animate. And so let's have a look at this again. So now I'm deleting and then I can go back to the original state. But I cannot select individual ones to reappear. So you can really create quite impressive and realistic actions with this. So here, for example, on drag, it shows me a little delete button and I can then delete one of those elements here. So how did I do this? 
Well, it's exactly the same principle. So here we have our elements that I used over here and I simply filled them with my content. And then within my component set here, you can see that I have my default um, element here and it already contains the delete button. So if I switch off this content here, you can see that's already down here and that's really important because remember, Smart Animate needs a beginning and an end to function. So in my delete here, all I did, I moved this label here to the left. So this will be my dragging animation. And I simply connected them with a drag animation. So on drag, change to and Smart Animate. And then once this is clicked and Note how this is only linked to this delete icon, not to the rest of my element. So if this is linked, then it's going to go here. And this one is set in this case to one. I could also set this to zero. And this is why it looks like it's deleting because over here, my instances are simply set up with auto layout. And therefore, if one of them is set to zero, then all of them will shift up. I really encourage you to play with interactive components and auto layout because you can really create very impressive prototypes with this technique. One place where interactive components become especially powerful is if we combine them with auto layout. So here I have a component set with two frames, a red one and a blue one of different size. Now I'm just going to pull over some instances here and I'm going to place them on my frame over here. And now I'm going to add some prototyping. So if I click on the red one, then I say change to and smart animate into the blue shape. And I'm going to return this from the blue shape to the red one. So on click, change to red and smart animate. Now let's have a look what that looks like. And so far, there is no auto layout applied anywhere. So you can see that if I click, then it changes. And you can see that here it becomes larger, but they sort of run into each other. And if I click again, then they go back to the original shape. And the Smart Animate is working within this click animation. However, let's have a look what happens if I select all of them. And now in design, I am turning that into an auto layout frame. Let's actually move that frame up a little bit and give it some more space and you'll see why in a minute. And now let's press play. So now you can see my frame here. And as I click, you can see that it shifts up and down. And the reason is that remember auto layout always takes up all the available space. And this is how I can smart animate and make other content respect the new size. And I can really take this to the extreme. So let's say that I am setting this blue shape here to zero. And notice how Figma never gives me zero. It always just gives me this um, one here. So a little trick around it is go 0 0.004 or something like this. And then it's going to go to zero. So it's still here, my element, but it's hidden. So now let's play again. And now you can see that if I click on this red one here, then they disappear. The only thing is you probably wonder if you can add a little plus button or add again and then add them. Well, that's not really going to work because theoretically they're all here and Figma doesn't remember which one you just clicked and which one you didn't. You could, however, simulate it. So you could add, let's say, let's just add a little round button here and say this is the plus button. So what we could do is we could say um, once they're deleted and I click on this one, I'm simply going to copy the same version of the already existing one here. And then I'm going to connect this. So on click navigate to and smart animate. And so let's have a look at this again. So now I'm deleting. And then I can go back to the original state, but I cannot select individual ones to reappear. So you can really create quite impressive and realistic actions with this. So here, for example, on drag, it shows me a little delete button and I can then delete one of those elements here. So how did I do this? 
Well, it's exactly the same principle. So here we have our elements that I used over here and I simply filled them with my content. And then within my component set here, you can see that I have my default um, element here and it already contains the delete button. So if I switch off this content here, you can see that's already down here and that's really important because remember, Smart Animate needs a beginning and an end to function. So in my delete here, all I did, I moved this label here to the left. So this will be my dragging animation. And I simply connected them with a drag animation. So on drag, change to and Smart Animate. And then once this is clicked and Note how this is only linked to this delete icon, not to the rest of my element. So if this is linked, then it's going to go here. And this one is set in this case to one. I could also set this to zero. And this is why it looks like it's deleting because over here, my instances are simply set up with auto layout. And therefore, if one of them is set to zero, then all of them will shift up. I really encourage you to play with interactive components and auto layout because you can really create very impressive prototypes with this technique. I want to show you a little trick that I call funnel components. What they basically do is that they connect components in prototyping across different pages and files. Here's my design that is made up of a home page, about page, workshop, and a newsletter section. And as you can see here, I can navigate to all of them from my header. Now, if we click on the header, we can see from the purple color and the empty diamond shape that it's an instance. If we have a look where our main component is, then we jump over to a separate component page, or this might be even be in a completely different file, because usually it's good practice to not store your components together with your design. So for our prototyping, that now means that I have to go through each page and then I have to make the corresponding connections. So I'd have to go first of all, through my page here, my blog page. Then I have to go to my about us page and link back. And I would have to do all of this for each of the pages. Now, once I did this, which is quite a lot of work, if I want to make any changes, let's say like the newsletter, I noticed it opens a new page, but this is actually an overlay. Then I'd have to go through each and every page and change this. Let's delete all of those connections and find another solution. By the way, little trick, right click on your canvas in prototyping mode and you can go to remove all interactions. Let's also remove this flow here and let's have a look. So the first thing you might want to do is jump into the main component section. So what I really want is I want to have this master here basically. And then whenever I click on workshop, so let's say I add an interaction. If I click, I want to navigate to workshop. But as you can see, I cannot access currently in Figma any other pages. And as I said here, we just stored the component in another page, but this component might be in a completely different file. So we can use a little trick and hereby you can simply copy the component or you can also use any of these instances you already have here. I'm just going to start from scratch and I create this instance. Now I could connect this instance, but the thing is this instance wouldn't give anything off to the other instances. It needs to be a main component. So we're doing this little trick here and selecting it and then packaging this instance inside another component. So we're creating a new component and I'm going to call this funnel. So if we look inside our funnel component, you can see that it simply contains an instance of our main navigation. So if we would jump back here, then I end back wherever that is stored. Okay, so back in our design, what we need to do now is that we're replacing all of our existing instances with this funnel component. So I'm just going to go here and then components. And then I'm going to go. So right now it's looking at the component page and I'm going into the design page and I'm choosing navigation funnel. You could also just delete them, make a copy of this, then it's an instance and replace them.
So now if I select any of these instances and I jump back to the main component, then it jumps up here to my funnel. So now all I need to do is connect the funnel in my prototyping with my screens once. So this one goes, let's set this to the solve to the blog. This one goes to the workshop. Then this one over here goes to about and my subscribe button. I want to open an overlay. So on click, open overlay newsletter. So now you can see if I click here, then they inherited all of those connections. So all of these pages automatically have the connection. And if I change anything in here, then they're going to inherit this. Let's have a look at this and this works just fine. I can click through this and from anywhere I can access my newsletter. So I'm really only using those funnel components to set up my prototyping. They have nothing to do with the main component. So any changes in the design of the main component would simply be picked up by my funnel component. As long as the naming and hierarchy is not changed, then even the connections would stay in place. So once you finish your prototype, you want to share it with others. Let's have a look at ways that we could do this. So here I have an example of a prototype and you can see that I am working on the same page on my mobile design as well as my desktop design. And you can also see that I already have different flows set up. If I click on the gray background while in prototyping, then you can see down here an overview of all my flows. So what I like doing is I like giving them a bit of a structure. So I use mob for mobile flows and desk for desktop flows. And then um, I can have the same flow. So login. So I have a mobile login and a desk login. And then two would be browse and add. And here you can see I only have that set up for mobile currently. I can also shuffle those. So here, for example, I can just move them around and then I can sort them in the order or rename them the way I need to. So now if we jump into our presentation mode, you can see here on the left hand side, I have them nicely ordered. And so I can see mobile and desktop along each other and I can simply click through all of them and they will obviously connect with the entire um, with the entire prototype, but I can still jump to specific sections that I want to highlight. Now this is quite nice, but I can add an additional layer of overview for everybody entering my files. Note how when we hover over one of these flows, we get a link here. So we can click on copy link. So for example, for the mobile login. And then what I like doing is I like to set up a little overview. So here I have one page for my mobile view and one for my desktop. And by the way, you might just have one if you're just working on a mobile app or you might have several for tablet as well. That really depends on what you're working on. And then all I do here is I type out the different flows that I want. Also, maybe some of them I haven't worked yet. And then simply select your text, link it, and then you can copy the link that you just copied from the right hand side here from the flows inside of this little overview. So anybody entering my file could directly click on those links. So they don't need to understand that they have to go to preview or anything. They simply click on here and then the preview would open and it would give an overview of my prototype. It will always start directly on the flow that I added the link to. The little bubbles next to it is just something that I like using. So you can see here in my design tab, this is like from an external file. So let's just jump over there. Let's just open this file. And here I simply have variants set up so I can see in what phase it is for testing and in what phase the prototype is. So here I have the first one is that the prototype is in progress. So for example, view book, I haven't finished this flow yet um, and therefore it needs to be tested. And here you can see that the login, the prototype has always been already been finished and it's currently being tested. 
you can absolutely customize this to your needs. You could add a name of responsibility. You could add dates, whatever you need here. I quite like this because in this way, we can already plan all the flows and all the different steps that we want to build as a prototype. And we can also see what happens in testing. And here, for example, the testing has already been done and therefore we need to go back and prototype needs adaption. So there's probably some feedback from the testing and I'm going to rework my prototype accordingly. Also, as this is set up on a frame, I can simply press play and use this as a presentation slide. And also remember our little trick that we can embed animated frames inside presentation. So here, this is my whole prototype. So this is my vertical scroll frame. And I simply placed this into my presentation here. And now I can play this. Let's switch this one off. So and I can scroll through this. I can um, click on single elements and I can really set up my design like this. And I can also show my overview with the flows so I can have a presentation that includes my prototyping. You can also invite people to your file or just your prototype by sending them a link. There are a few things to consider when you do this. So you could invite people directly via the share link to your prototyping file. They would then need to hit the play button and they could see the prototype in action. Now, a lot of the time you might not want people in your design file. You just want to present them the prototype. And that might just be your prototype as such embedded in presentation view with some different flows, or it might be a presentation that you set up and is viewable and clickable in presentation view. So instead of sharing the entire file, while in prototyping view, note how the button changes to share prototype. So in our design file, you'll see it's simply called share. And then in our prototyping view, share prototype. So if we click on this, we will only share the link to this prototyping view. It will include all the flows that you set up. Now, before we share our prototype, we want to make sure that it's set up exactly the way that we want the person at the other end to view it. So under option, we can choose um, what size we want to display our prototype. And then we can also choose whether we want to show or hide our flows. And so everything that we set up here will be stored in our sharing link. And then the person on the other end will get exactly those settings. And that doesn't only include the settings in prototyping view. If we jump back to our design, remember that we could on the prototype show prototype settings. So you can here set a background color and more important, we could set a device. However, you have to be a bit careful with this. If you're purely working, let's say in mobile view, and now let's jump back. Then we can add a device around it, which is actually a really nice for a presentation. However, if you're mixing mobile and desktop, then notice what happens here because our desktop view will actually be squished into this device. So if you're mixing devices, then make sure that you have your device set to none. So I'm going to jump back to the first flow where I wanted to start and I can now press share prototype. So here I can invite via email or I can also set the preference for link. And here you can choose between can edit, can view and can view prototype. Now, if you invite with can edit, that means people have full access to your file and can edit your design. This might also come with additional costs for new editors. So be very careful when and if you share this one. Can view is free, but it means that people can view your entire design file. Now, we want to stay at can view prototypes. So we're only sharing the prototyping view, including our flow overview. And I can now invite via email or set the link as well and just copy a link and send it off. As soon as people enter your file, you can also always edit their rights. 
So anyone with the link can now simply open this link either in their browser or it will jump into their Figma app if they have it open. And you'll see that even if they're not logged in, they get a little preview and they can still like jump through your prototype. With the link, you could also open the prototype if you have the Figma app installed on your mobile device. Now, with this one, you just need to be a little careful because this screen size that you set up in Figma should be the same size that fits your physical device you're using. Otherwise, it's going to be stretched or pushed together and this might lead to strange results. Let's talk about how we could document interactions in Figma. So far, we had a look at how we communicate our setup for prototyping in general. So how we can show those interactions from one page to another. But the thing that we also really need to communicate and especially document are our micro interactions. So what happens on hover and all the different states that are embedded in our interactive components. Your components might be stored in the same file on a separate page, or they might be in a completely different file and you pull them in via shared libraries. So as I'm working with a really simplified example, just to show you how to set up documentation, I just have a few components here and I simply save them on their own page. By the way, if you want to move components from one page to another, then you cannot simply copy and paste them. You need to select the component or component set, right click, and then go to move to page, and then you can select the destination where you want to send them. So we're going to use this card here as an example, and I'm going to show you how to document this and how to communicate the interaction and little animation that's happening within the component for your handoff to development. So this is a general setup I use, but you can absolutely adjust this to your needs. But let's go step by step. So first of all, I am taking the entire component set and I'm moving it onto this frame that I set up. And notice how it's still a component set, but as soon as you move it to a frame, then the little component sign up here is gonna disappear. So I move it on here and you can see that I have this set up. So I have a header that I always use, and in this case it's called card, I give it a number, and this is the documentation. I have a little stamp here. So this is also a variant set that I set up. I can just open this for you in another file. And so you can see here there's different stages. And so I can go from approved to difficult, which happens quite a bit, and progress and so on. So this one here would be approved. Then because I moved my main component inside of this frame, if we go to the assets panel, you can see that here have my local components, the one that I didn't move on a frame, they're just like floating around here. And as soon as you move it to the frame, this is the name of the frame up here, then you can open it and it's going to be nicely stored inside. So this is going to give a really nice order to all your components. Then what I like doing is just pulling out an instance. So I can also have the instance here because here, for example, if we would play this um, documentation sheet, then we would see the animation happening here in this instance already. You can also add other information. So for example, I quite like having a screenshot. So here you see all your component properties. I'm just going to add this here, add a bit of an effect, and um, then you can get a, get a really nice overview. So even though everybody can see this, if they click on a component, I'm still making it very clear that this component contains different properties. And one of these property is the different states from default and you can swap to hover. So I'm just highlighting this again. So I don't want to talk much more about general documentation because that's a different topic and a different course you can take. But just to show you, then I'll run through it. So I have my specs set up here so you can see all the measurement, how everything behaves. And I can always give a bit of text information. And this is actually the part we're interested in right now. So here I have my animation. And so what I do is I simply have an instance here. So one default and then the hover state. And I say here on hover, it will ease out 800 milliseconds. And then over here in my um, information boxes, I can just add some more information. 
So here I talk about the trigger, so in my case on hover, and I describe the action a little bit more. Now I am describing this already with a bit of CSS in mind. This is not necessary, you can also just describe what happens. But if you want a little bit of CSS notation or any other code notation, then you can simply jump to the inspect tab and also note that you're sharing with view mode only with your development. So this is what they're going to see automatically. And as soon as they select any element, this is their information. So what I did, I simply copied the back shadow CSS notation, for example, from here. You can also change over to iOS or Android, depending on what you're working on. If you're wondering where I got the transformation scale from, then I want to show you a little trick. So right now in my component set here, the images are the exact same size. And then instead of just manually changing this, what you can do is select the image and hit K and the K button will open the scaling menu. And now here you can choose a size. You can also choose where you want to start. So I'm starting from the bottom in the middle and then I am adding 1.2, for example, and it will scale it by 1.2. And now you can simply use this scale, which will be the same in CSS. And then what I like to do is to add a little play button because there's really nothing like a demo of the actual thing to get your idea across. And how I set this up is I simply draw a frame and I add an instance to it. So the instance contains all interaction you set up in your component set. Let me show you. So if I jump to prototyping, then you can see here, this is where my interaction is set up. And then this will obviously like all other instances inherit this behavior. And so now if I click here on the background, you can see that this is called card animation and the flow is called card. And I can simply copy the link and I can now add the link to this play animation text. So as soon as someone would click on play, then it would open in this flow and they could see the micro interaction as a little demo. You could of course also link to your entire document. So I have a separate flow just here. And by the way, if you press Z, then you can toggle through the view. So you could have a overall view of the page or you could just have a detailed view and you can see that in the instance, all instances actually you're using across your design, you would also see their interaction. I would set up a page for each and every component that I am using. And if there's an animation, I add the animation part if you don't have any interaction and obviously you don't need this. If you're wondering, this last part here is simply the responsive behavior. So this is just about how my component and would sit in the design as the screen size is changing. So you can see here I'm using a grid for my design and it would be always the same component and simply change the number of columns that it occupies. So testing and documenting responsive behavior is a big separate topic. If you're interested, I have a whole separate Moon Learning course on this. You might use an external system to document your design and code. In your Figma file under sharing, you can also select get embed code and then simply copy this code to embed. Some applications also connect directly with Figma. You can get a list of the currently supported applications under the Figma website, then click on get started, connect Figma to other apps, embed Figma. And then at the very, very end of this page, you'll find a list of all the currently supported applications. And note that this is usually browser-based applications. So you could have your external documentation in Notion, Dropbox, Confluence, and the one I really like is Zero Height. So I'm gonna show you a little example on how embedding works with Zero Height. So one of my absolute favorites for documentation with Zero Height is the example of the Decathlon design system, which you can access via decathlon.design. Now here we'll click on digital and this page that you're seeing here, this is all built in zero height. So we want to see how they documented their interaction. So let's click on components and a really nice detail here as well. You get first an overview of all the components and their current state for different versions. So let's just click 
into the first one, a button, and you can see that we can choose between web, Android and iOS. So we're just going to go for web right now. And then here they set up their documentation. And so we get a general anatomy of the button, usage examples, specifications, and so on. And um, Zero Hide really gives you the opportunity to build this the way that you want to. So you could have separate pages for design and code, or you could have it all together. It's really up to you. Um, and now what we want to see is how do they show us the hover states? So you can see they call it showcase and in showcase there is an embed and you can see the different hover states for this button. And now let's jump back into components and you can see that, for example, let's go to card that um, they also link all of this to Figma. So here you can see again, anatomy, usage, and here, unfortunately, we don't see the behavior, but what they have, which is really nice, they show you a little video on how to use this in Figma. So here they also describe how different states are used. And of course, they also have a section that explains how team members connect to the Figma files. And by the way, you can also have a copy of those Figma files and play with them. If you're not part of the Decathlon team, simply go to the Figma community section, search for Decathlon, and you can duplicate them and play with them. So let's try it out ourselves. In Zero Height, we can get one free project and try it out for free. And this is my free project and I can just customize everything about this here. And then here you see the view that's pretty similar already to what we saw with Decathlon. So what I did is in components, I added just a new page called card and you can customize all of these sections to your needs. So here you can see that I already uploaded some things and how this works is that you can connect directly with your Figma file. And so I already set this up here. You can see you simply have to add the link to your file in zero is going to prompt you how to do that. And then you can go through all your elements. So here I can go through my color styles, import them, my components, my different pages. And so all I did here, I selected card and you can see this is already added. If I wanted to add the avatar, I could simply select this, press to add, and then you can see it would upload all the states of the avatar. So it would also upload the default and the hover state for me. Let's get rid of this because we don't want this in this example. So here you can see I have my card, so I have my different states and also with the layout settings here, you can customize this so I could have different ways to display this. And I can also add, which I really like the component properties. So here you have hover and default right now and could also add more and add notes and so on. So I did add my specs here, but actually I wouldn't even need them because you can just click onto any of those which you imported from Figma and then it will open its own inspect mode. So here you can just click on the different elements and you get all the different information in inspect view. So up here, you can also see that on this page, I'm setting up everything from design from Figma. And then I would have a separate page here where from code, we could connect to now the card component that it's coded. So it's really like a fantastic way of bringing everything into one page. And as I said, this is a setup that Zero Hide suggests. You can also mix all of this on one page so you could have your Figma design and then the code connection below. That's really up to you. So further down here, you can see that I uploaded some examples. So here I have the images so you can see how this component is being used. But what we don't have and what we want to add now is the interaction behavior. So first I want to add my prototype. So if I click on play, that's the prototype I want to add. So if I click here, then this goes to a new page and it also has my micro interactions embedded. So I go to share prototype and now I only need to copy the link for zero height. I don't need an embed. Okay, let's jump back to zero height and I can already see to display a prototype use embed sections. So I click on here and then I need to select not code, not design upload, but embed. And now I simply enter my Figma link in here and you'll see 
that it's directly loading my prototype. I can now pull the window to the size that I want. Let's get this a little larger because you can see that this is sort of squished in the top. So now you can see it well. And now you can see that it is embedding my prototype and I can simply click through it. If you have more flows, by the way, and you copy the link with the flows tab open from Figma, then it's also going to show your flows in this preview. Now, I also want to just add this little animation here of the component in isolation. So I don't need this whole documentation because I can set all of this up in zero height. What I quite like doing, I have it in Figma and then I, for example, copy those elements over to zero height for explanation. But for now, all I want is this one. So let's press play to get to the prototyping tab. And now I'm going to close my flows because otherwise this would show and I just want to show this. Um, and let's go to share prototype copy link. So I'm actually going to add this first. So again, I need to use embed and then I copy the link I just got from my preview and it's the same as we did before. So now we can open the window here and this is going to stay the way that you set this up. So now I have this little interaction and then you can see my component in action. So this is what our page would look like to anybody visiting it. So here you can see we have our components with inspect and then down here we have our examples. And at the end we have our micro interaction showing as well as our clickable and scrollable prototype here. Well done for finishing this course.